Good evening and welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. And this evening I'm going to be chattering with Mark Towers, who is uh, sitting in the background at the moment. I'll, inv I'll invite him onto the show in just a couple of seconds. But before I do that, I just there are a few things I want to share with you. The first is the T-shirt that I'm wearing, which hopefully you can see this. This is done by a young lady called... This was done by a young lady called Lilith who lives in Australia. Uh, when I say young, she's nine years old. Um, I'm informed by her dad that she hasn't seen the Hellraiser movies <laughs> uh, or anything of that ilk. Um, he's, uh, but he very kindly sent me across a, a T-shirt. It says, no more tears, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. And I'm thinking that's such a great work. That's such a parenting attitude. Um, <laughs> If your child is crying, you could use this line on them in, in a very weird way. Um, so thank you very much indeed to Lilith and her dad for um, uh, sending the T-shirt, which I'm very proud to wear. Um, as I mentioned the week before last, I, uh, I actually filmed my first short film last weekend. I was just telling Mark about, I was just discussing this earlier on. Um, thank you to everybody who... who who's been asking me about it and particularly to the 16 people who came along last Saturday night and then went out into the freezing cold and I do mean it was literally zero degrees celsius outside we started about six o'clock in the evening we finished about 4 30 in the morning um thank you so much to everybody there is more to i'll be talking about more and more sharing more about that in the coming weeks but in the meantime there is now a facebook page which you can like and i'll put a link up on the page and on my website and in both places you can sign up to a newsletter to find out more about that so that's the night whispered and I'm very excited. I've seen the footage, um, and even just the footage before it's uh, actually um, been edited. I'm going, this looks really good. I'm really pleased with this. So, yeah, that's done. Um, but, yeah, so that's enough about me for the moment. Mark, do please say hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. A lot warmer than last weekend, obviously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, like, that just, sounds like you're braving the elements for... it's just I, I couldn't believe it the one thing the cameraman said to me um, before uh, we started when we did our recce because he came over a couple of weeks earlier and we brought the cast in as well just to see if we could you know because we knew we were going to shoot over such a short period of time uh -huh. we wanted to make sure that we were as prepared as possible and um he was saying the one thing you don't want is rain. And I thought, yeah, it's not going to rain. And then I was just watching the temperature drop as we approached it. And then after the weekend, it went back up again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They were it just, just descended just for you. It descended just for me. And it was the 21st of November, and we were still having firework displays. I have no idea why we were having. Yeah, that's uh, that would be a problem. I bet your sound guy loved you, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> It, we discovered we were under the flight path of uh, i'd never realized that we were under the flight path and surely they should stop well of course we we started about six o'clock in the evening um surely they should eight. stop just for you say again so, surely they should stop just for you yeah yeah so. yeah yeah hold off the whole of heathrow i'm sure nobody would mind <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, ah, it, was, it was it was extraordinary experience. But as I say, I will be doing. Uh, I'm probably do a show in the uh, in the new year with some of the people involved, um, uh, because composers, editors, and, and so on. Um, just about uh, this because I think it's going to be really really exciting. Yeah. Um, cool. So that, yeah, as I say, that was me talking about that. But let's talk about the alpha invention. Um, what? How did the Alpha Invention start? What first kicked off the idea? How did it all get going? Um, that's a good question. And it's, it's so many drafts back that I can't remember. Um, I think, I mean, I've, I've always been a science fiction fan, so that was something I wanted to do. Obviously, dealing with short films and, um, and low budgets, uh, very low budgets, I, had, I wanted to do something contained in a single location a single uh -huh. room and uh i thought that it would be quite nifty and quite fresh as well because it's something i haven't seen too much done with that genre you see it a lot in horror films uh because it has that oppressive nature 
but um i want so i thought i'd try doing it with something else and then these ideas of kind of a a genius i suppose a, a, a um genius that's confined to his own apartment working on you know a big sci-fi idea which is the creation of artificial intelligence and then uh, 15 pages later i had a first draft so you know an hour later or something <laughs> and then uh, really, really interesting so how long ago is it when did you first start writing it? uh this must have been where are we 2015 24 that must have been 2012 so quite a quite a while about, ago nearly three years about three years ago yeah um so and then i, I spent ages redrafting it and like various bits this is why i can't even remember um i i too frightened to go back and look at that first draft and see what it's like but i bet it's quite a lot different because various elements started coming in um noir is also a genre favorite of mine so i was pulling elements of that in and it was kind of the sci-fi premise laid out in the first draft and then the seasoning of noir if you like was put over in later drafts and things like that so uh yeah it it um quite suitably evolved you know from uh, right right so you think you're, you're, you're heavily influenced by noir you mean the 1940s not the original noir or, or Ev everything um so with the cast and crew i'd show them stuff like the big sleep so um loads of powered hawk stuff um double indemnity and then we go up through obviously the the obvious sci-fi noir like blade runner things like that um neo noir like heat michael mann's heat um the whole range of everything because it is neo noir it's not set in the 40s it doesn't have kind of uh you know kind of a a surrealist aesthetic in the sense of it being cyberpunk or anything like that it is set in the modern day and it's about something happening in the modern day um so you know neo noir for a lot of the lighting techniques as well was something i was pointing at to say see how these films are looking at those previous films from the 1940s you know uh, in terms of the influences of german expressionist art or whatever and high contrast areas of lighting uh mixed with low contrast you know it's very interesting. I think one of the things that's very noticed, I mean, just from the you know, one of the original opening shots, which is of rain on the window. Yeah. And I have to ask, I mean, it's such a stupid question. How did you get the rain on the window <laughs> so effectively? <laughs> that's uh, Anna Page, my production designer, with a uh, with a with just a spray bottle against, against the plexiglass. So <laughs> with a macro lens, yeah. That's how Wait, it and was it just water? Because it seemed to coalesce so beautifully. Yeah, no, it was water. I mean, uh, we obviously backlit it quite a bit, but it's not like a mix of hair gel or anything to thicken it. Or anything like that. It was just... We just, the, I mean, the, the shot you see lasts something like five seconds mm. and there's, there's probably about three four five minutes of footage so and i was just sit, standing there on a step ladder you know spraying above and it, we're filming here and like she's spraying here and then it's just dripping down dripping. And I'm, keep going keep going keep going <laughs> refill the water keep going keep going and then we got that little bulb of water like you said coalesce in the center of it and i was like you know jumping up and down i think the actors are probably thinking, we don't get a celebration like this. It's sort of writing about a droplet of water going down the window. But yeah, I knew instantly that was the bit I was going to find and put in the cut. So. Wow, well, wow, well, wow, well, wow, well, wow. Well. So whereabouts, because as you say, it's one set. Um, uh, oh, that's interesting. So I've got, I've, I'm beginning to get questions coming in, right. um, uh, which I shall start sharing fairly shortly. Um, Whereabouts did you film? Uh, we filmed in Stoke Newington. Uh, in Stoke Newington? Yeah. Uh, there was a place and it's kind of a, a rehearsal area. It's not uh, strictly like a film studio. I think people even have like parties there and stuff. There's a little bar that we turned into our kitchen for catering, you know. Um, but it, it's just a, a space and um, we went there and built the set. So we had a, a day of building the set shot for three days and then a day of uh of breaking it down that's, um, that's fine I, I'm, I'm surprised it was only three days because you seem to have achieved an awful lot in your three days 
Yeah, um, yeah, I suppose it was. The first day was our, like the Masters, and we'd do the whole thing through. Uh, so it was, like, it was like if you were sitting there as part of the crew, it was like watching theatre, you know. You've got um, the three walls, the fourth wall missing, and you're, you're watching it, and we, you know, we'd just go over from the Master angles the whole way through. Uh, so all 15 minutes. And then <clears throat> the second day, we do shots that I knew I wanted from various different angles. And then the third day was what we called trick shots, which are the more complicated stuff that might take a while. So you dedicate, you know, two, three hours to getting something which might sound simple, but can go so wrong, such as uh, starting normal and zooming in or dollying in, sorry, to a Dutch angle. Right. You see in films all the time, but <laughs> it's so it's amazing how many takes it can take for to achieve the camera move, you know. And what what camera were you using? Uh, we shot on two cameras. We had a Sony F fifty five, so that was shooting in four K, and then we had a Black Magic four K uh, for more of those mobile shots, like the ones I was talking about, those trick shots, because they that's a bit more mobile, and we had like a, one of those movie stabilizer systems you know yeah we we um, used, yeah no, i know i happen to know what you're talking about because yeah. i used one on a f short film i did recently and i was acting in uh called rats um i was yeah, absolutely fascinated <laughs> yeah by this thing you know a really complex it looks it sounds fairly easy but actually they're very complex and they were having all sorts of problems and all i remember is that every so often the camera just went <laughs> yeah no that, that and if you uh also it because it's it's a gyro system yeah so when so in the end this is what i mean about getting that dutch angle shot we tried that but every time you tilt it so far the computer or whatever's working it out starts freaking out and the camera starts going <laughs> and like you know going crazy so it wasn't working so in the end we just did it handheld and smoothed it out in post but yeah um, things you think would work start uh, going awry and you have to right. come up right, with right. a plan B on the spot. Now, so you, you, got, you built the set. You, as you said, you had three sides to your set. Did you permanently have three sides or were you able to move one of the walls to get some of the... Yeah, no, shots? we moved all the walls at one point. So all the walls fly, uh, were flyable. Um, so most of those masters were obviously from one side. But it was, and I remember thinking after that first day, I can't wait to start doing the other stuff because you just feel like you're shooting an American sitcom for those days, you know. It's just from one side and it's like friends or something. But so once you start shooting from the other sides, it starts feeling like a proper room, you know. Right. So every single one of the four walls was flown at one point and we shot from that side. Yeah. And, and the other thing I find absolutely fascinating about this movie is that obviously this is a phone conversation um, mm. that you're watching. You So Billy Boyd, and we'll come to how you got Billy Boyd and, and William Hope involved later uh, in a few moments, but you've got a phone conversation going on on set. How did you, How is it that Billy was... Billy, and you also had William Hope on set <clears throat> as well. So how did you do that phone conversation so that they could both hear each other and so yeah we we've got our set built um and william was in his armchair he had a dedicated armchair but he just sat and he had the script on his own ipad he just but there's videos of him like making of and he's just scrolling through it reading and uh he just live be giving that uh feedback to billy to bounce off of as he's sitting on set with the phone pretending it's coming through the phone receiver obviously um, so there, there's literally just a, a very thin, flyable wall between them, and they're either side of that talking to each other. So how did so did you record William's voice at that moment? I was because I was I was wondering about the um, uh, pollu sound pollution of William's voice when you've got Billy. Yeah, no, we recorded at that moment, so he was all mic'd up. He had his own kind of his armchair became his little sound booth. And he's doing it and he could, he was there for the first day. He very kindly came for the first day. I thought I was going to have to record his voice in post, right. which could have led to all different kinds of problems. And then a week before he kindly said, 
when are you, you you're doing this Monday to Wednesday? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, you know what? I'm I'm free Monday. I can probably come down. And I was like, that would be so much more helpful from the perspective that Billy's then got the actual performance to work off of. So he's he's more happy, and you get a a better performance out of both sides. They can start, you know, ad libbing to a degree, but it's just the tonalities of voice that would match up better when you've got both of them working against one another. Uh, or with one another and uh, and then also <laughs> you know I don't have to then get a sound booth in post-production do that bit and then plug that into the edit afterwards I've got the sound and I can start editing as soon as we've wrapped our three-day shoot so um, yeah it was fantastic it worked out really well it, yeah because I was it, it reminds me have you seen the film lock with Tom Hardy yes yeah. yeah, it's a similar thing. It's basically it's all phone conversations, and basically they had him driving up and down a motorway, and he and they, could hear people literally coming over the his earpiece. Yes, and I remember watching that and thinking they must, if you're doing it for the feature, they must have done it. And I I looked into it, and they for lock, they they're actual phone calls. So the, all the other actors were in a hotel room, and they just get them to call in at the right time, and. Uh, and so he's actually answering a genuine phone call and speaking to them over the phone, you know. It makes it so much easier as an actor. Yes, be I bet to... it does. I bet it does. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise you're just kind of having to play it over in your head or you've got somebody else. I mean, often, you, as you know, um, normally you would have another actor reading in the in the lines yes um even if you do, if you don't have your actual actor available you have somebody else reading in the lines but actually having your william there it must have made it so much easier um you know, for billy to have that now i know this does bring me to this question so how did you get billy boyd involved and and william hope uh yeah i hired um a great casting director matt weston and uh i said to him I approached him with this script and, you know, I said, we don't have an abundance of budget. Um, we don't have an abundance of credit to our names, but I think, and I hope we've got a really great script script and he liked it. Um, and he started asking about actors and I said, you know, um, who do you think we can get on board? And Billy's name came up and I had the, um, the idea that guy, the central character was, had some Celtic origin. I don't right. know why. It's just one of those things that pops into your head when you're writing the dialogue. It was in a Scottish or Irish accent. Um, Billy, you know, I've I know him obviously from um, what most of you know him from is Pippin in Lord of the Rings, uh, and I'm a big fan of those films. But also, like those things he was in earlier that I remember watching uh, back when I was too young and shouldn't be watching all these horror films, like Hellraiser, was things like um, Urban Ghost Story, which um, Billy was a part of very early on. Chris Jones was involved with that. And um, yeah, it, he I'd almost subconsciously been tracking his career without knowing it. And it immediately clicked. And so I said to Matt, do you think we can get him? And he said, well, we can try. And then he sent the script off and I just waited for, it wasn't too long, probably about five days or something. And then was told he was gonna ring me. And then we talked for an hour kind of like you and I are, we talked about the influences, um, Howard Hawks films, all that kind of thing, uh, the neo-noir influences. And uh, he just said he, on the phone then, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm coming on board, I like it a lot. And then with that, uh, we searched for the right voice for, for Walter at the other end of the line. And obviously it's a very distinctive voice. Um, and Matt played me, sorry, my ear is coming out. Matt played me, um, you know, sent me show reels and everything. And um, Williams was one of them. And immediately I was like, Lieutenant Gorman for Aliens, wow. And I was listening to his voice as it's changed over his career and as he's got older. And I was, it was just pitch perfect. I was like, that was the voice that was in my head to be in with. So um, we asked him and he kind of came on board as well. It's very interesting. That is very interesting because, I mean, William Hope... Um Obviously, he's an American actor, oh, Canadian, Canadian, actor? Canadian, Canadian yeah. actor, based in the UK. Um, yeah. In fact, and I've probably told the story before. I used to work over in Clapham, yeah. and 
Uh, I was worked there for about 16 years, and every so often I'd see him in the street, and I never introduced myself because I re realized uh, this was just one of the movies that he'd made, and we'd never actually met. Yeah. Because we were never on set at the same yes, time. Uh, I don't actually remember being in the studio, and I don't think I was ever actually introduced to William. Um, and I love what he does with the part. I think he does a great part. You know, yeah, yeah. Great job. Uh, in Hellbound, um, but we've never actually spoken to each, as far as I'm aware, um, or as far as I can remember, more or less the same thing. Uh, we've never actually spoken to each other, um, but he, you hear him do read a lot of stories uh, on on Radio Four Extra um, and so on. He does yeah. do an awful lot of voiceover work. Yeah, um, no, and you can understand why he's just got one of those voices that you immediately. My even my my mum was on set at one point, and she was just like, "God, he's got a fantastic voice, hasn't he? You picked the right guy for that." It's like he really like, does. He really, really does. He, he manages. Uh, he he, yeah, um, I mean. he really is. So uh, again, just thinking about them, um, uh, the, the 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 actual filming of it. Before we move on <clears> to the, the next thing I want to talk about, which is the the films, uh, the fe film festivals. What was the most technically challenging part? I mean, it sounds like a complex set. If you got, you know, if you got flyable, uh, presumably they didn't actually physically go up your walls. You had to pull them back out and move them over. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had to scoot them along in, uh, you know, manual labor style. Um, the most technical challenge, I suppose, it was something that we nailed in pre-production. And uh, if there's any of the crew watching now, they're going to shudder when I say this word because I said it so many times, but it was Venetian blinds, the right Venetian blinds. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, they hate none of them. I guarantee you have Venetian blinds in their, their personal homes now because they'll just start <laughs> going insane at the sight of them because um, the, the blades of light were like a very important aesthetic because, and it's not just, you know, being pedantic about, something that you want to look right it's a it's a genre trope that subconsciously immediately says something to the audience yep. even if they're not completely aware of it you know you're like right it's that kind of movie and there's an early shot in the film where we really show those blades of light coming through so it was a combination of the right thickness and dimensions of blinds we went through so many <laughs> no 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 until we found the right ones and also uh, the right level of smoke. So my DP, Michael Spry, and producing partner, and I would, um, we did a test shoot at, um, at a friend's flat, and they had Venetian blinds. We just filled it with smoke and different gels of lights to get the right uh, consistency. So it, it didn't look so much like smoke. You know, it just had that as atmospheric vibe to it. Um, I, 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 I'm going to have to go back and look at it again now because I don't, <laughs> I wasn't conscious of it being smoke. I was very conscious of the Ven the Venetian blinds, partly yeah. because of the behind this, the, the the making of featurette that you've got on the um, uh, EPK. Yeah. Um, and I, I was looking at those. And I thought, You're absolutely right. That is the one thing that just cries out film noir. Yes. To exactly. me, because it, it, it is. It's just that play of light and dark, light and dark, light and dark, light and light yeah. and dark. Um, I right. So. Do you remember the make of the Venetian blind that you eventually <laughs> no, chose? I don't now. I was completely uh, erased from my memory. I don't even know where they are. They're, I should have taken them and hung them up here, but uh, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> I think they were so I just think We've got some IKEA you. Venetian blinds around somewhere, which are just these lovely wo thick wooden slats. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they were. They were. Yeah. It had to be the right thickness as well, so that they blocked out the entire amount of light you know, for the camera, because even to the human eye, it can look like they're doing that. But then when you see it on the on the monitor, right, uh, on playback, it's not got the same level of contrast. And like you say, it's the light, dark, light, dark that you want um, spreading across the room. And then also when um, Billy turns around in some of the shots, you've got the shadows on his face, which is, you know, another big noir trope. Um, and it happens at a key moment in the film. So uh, I was I was thinking, would we need different blinds, or you just get um, we just fake that and 
you know put it in front of the key lights but they worked for everything in the end they were just one of them was separate and we put it on flags and just take the wall out and so you'd have these two <laughs> phantom windows you know just hanging there and then film from that and look. that's brilliant okay well before we move on to the next bit which is you know, this is how you made the film um we'll kind of skip over the editing and, and, and process and so on and distribution there are a couple of questions that come in the first one is coming from joe from joe uh via twitter um just remind people it's chattering hashtag chattering nick if you want to use twitter for the questions um ai has always intrigued me my question is who would you pick to introduce an ai entity to humanity now this is quite <laughs> interesting question what person now uh, to me it would have to have been steve jobs if he was still with us right yeah because i think it would have to be an apple product um but <laughs> it's funny you say that because when uh billy's one of billy's questions was like is it is it there be a map that you've got there and i was like no no, no this this guy the character would be completely pc kind of nerdy build his own machines kind of stuff you know <laughs> he would like the apple products yeah no I was, what the the computer you're using actually i mean it was like cathode a good old-fashioned cathode ray tube no uh yes in the in the flashback scene so it goes, yeah. there's a quick flashback shot and we had to get one of those old deep chunky monitors that weigh a ton um and the only one we could find was one that wasn't working so that the code you see going across it is actual actually a visual effect shot um because the thing wouldn't work it's just broken and if you shook it it would just make rattling sounds there's sort of stuff components inside bouncing about but yeah to answer joe's question um yeah steve jobs is the most likely if he was still alive i can imagine him coming up with siri's uh descendant um i don't know i suppose the one i think now it'd be elon musk uh the guy who owns spacex and he talks about ai quite a bit yes and yes, the yes I, know who you mean. Like, I, I was reading about him the other month actually yeah. he's a fascinating guy very driven um <laughs> achieves a lot um to say the least but i can imagine him introducing it with the right degree of um trepidation and warning yeah i, I do th genuinely think it's uh it's an it's going to happen it's inevitably going to happen when it does is another question but it's what what do we there are ethical questions there it's not just siri is it it's not just a ne the next computer chip there's some no it's interesting there, there was something on my facebook timeline this morning and i don't think i got around to is one of those things you think did i share it i don't remember if i shared it or not but basically they were showing a small robot I, I mean, about 12 inches tall i've seen them before i can't remember quite who they're but basically they were teaching it to disobey right so that if you give it a stupid order so it was on this you know walk forward but there is no support right yeah. can you and then talk about being able to override its self-protection you don't yeah. have the level you know you do not have administration level yeah um well, that, and that's like that. and really interesting on the degree of um like the literary influences for alpha invention were i robot the the novel of i robot and that came up with something that's in every you know sci-fi film about artificial intelligence which is the three laws of robotics mm -hmm. and it's like you have to obey humans except but then one one robot uh puts their self-preservation and instinct that humans have above those three laws it just seems to break the code so it's interesting that they're, that they're teaching one to do that <laughs> <laughs> well yeah of course in, in the video that was made of it they immediately um i'm sorry I cannot do that. And I'm getting chills at the moment I think exactly. about it because I remember it's, seeing it. And you're half cinema. expecting it. That's the problem, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the ultimate thing. It, whenever anybody starts thinking about that, it's like, I'm sorry. I cannot do that, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, why on earth would you give a robot this lovely, soft spoken voice? Probably not to make you. Know, 
to make it more chilly. Challenging. <laughs> um, and so on. Yeah, but, to make yeah. it sound obedient, I suppose. But, yes. uh, that's why it's so so much more chilling when it disobeys. Yeah, yeah, no, way. absolutely. It's a great question. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. And um, this is from a lady called Kim Lehman. Um, hi, Kim. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, Mark, who would you say are your earliest influences in writing and directing? In earliest, the ones I picked up the earliest. Um, I, I suppose she means when when I was a child, what yeah. got me into things. Uh, I suppose it's going to be the usual. I mean, I remember the first films that really captured my attention were Jurassic Park, so Spielberg. Uh, I then went and watched all of his you know, earlier stuff, Jaws and stuff at an uh, incredibly young age and scared the pants off myself. Um, and then as I got older, um, things like uh, Friedkin, William Friedkin came to mind and, um, you know, The Exorcist and French Connection, all those kind of films. Um, and I also owe a lot, actually, uh, and... You know, I think this is another film that's evident in Alpha Invention. When I was 10 or 11, we had a birthday party, a sleepover at a friend's house, and we watched The Matrix, the first Matrix film. And I remember at that point thinking cinema was doing something, like, to me, better, personally for me, more than anything else, because it just blew my an 11 year old's mind on every single level, you know, like the, the, the story, the design, which, and people forget this, the first half of the matrix before it becomes a Kung Fu action film is very noir, very, yeah. very noir. And, uh, it's so from an aesthetic level, from a special effects level, obviously the action, and then all the, the kind of philosophy involved in it, it really, I just thought it was the, the best thing ever. And it became like my film, my personal favorite as it was for millions of other people at that at that era from 1999 onwards for a few years that that's very interesting i, th I think uh, it kind of begs another question as well did you study filmmaking no 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 i i've I haven't been to film school or anything i went to university but i did english literature and philosophy and uh i my film school i really owe to my dad my dad would sit down and uh you know he just he's one of those people who doesn't realize he's a film fan but actually is you know we go to blockbuster video store every friday and we get two or three vhs's and watch them over the weekend and uh there's a lot of stuff that probably i shouldn't be watching at such a young age like the exorcist or an alien and all that stuff but it was <clears throat> it was um it's what made me fall in love with cinema and then i just get more into it and start studying you know when you become of older say like 16 or something you're starting to see how they're crafted and getting really interested in that and um, what the film what the shot choices and editing techniques and the way that the directors have um, drawn out actors or how the actors have been cast um, and how that makes the film what it is rather than the millions of potential films that could have been made out of that script you know i suppose that's when you start getting involved in that and, uh, but in terms of actual techniques and so on did you read mm -hmm. any books or not much beyond um you know i i've got like there's a book somewhere like i had filmmaking for dummies and stuff that i think my mum bought me for one christmas or something and i'd yeah i'd devour them and just you know because i wanted to start doing this and i was making crappy little films with my friends when I was a teenager, you know, you go to the woods and do a really, really bad horror film or something like that, that like horror short. Um, and it was more getting the, getting the idea of how the industry worked and producing techniques and all this pre-production stuff, which as a teenager, I just didn't want to hear. I didn't want to hear that you had to spend months <laughs> organizing all this stuff before you can start shooting it. But, you know, it is the most important part, and you realise that. So, so in, that's an interesting question. Then, how long, how much pre-production did you put in? Obviously, you said you you wrote the first script back in yeah. twelve, but when and you mentioned that your DOP is also a co-producer. Yes, that's right. So, when did you officially 
And I think it's a very nebulous question because I think these things grow organically. Right. Yeah. I suppose it's from when we got Matt, the casting director on board and started approaching uh, actors. Um, so that was probably about a, a year and a bit in advance of right. the actual shoot. Um, Cause we've got that casting process done and one of our, when we are approaching obviously uh, some talent, uh, the way we were approaching it was we don't have a lot of money. We, um, what we do have is is flexibility on time. So when you can do it, we'll go, okay, let's get the show on the road. We're kind of ready to go. Um, so we were just waiting for those three days to open up in diaries where everyone can do it, so including crew as well. And, um, and in that time, I suppose we were using it for this stuff uh, torturing people with Venetian blinds and smoke and all that kind of stuff. Um, we did all that in the meantime. Um, so yeah, we were probably about a year and two months of pre-production of working stuff out, but it allowed us to get everything on that molecular level sorted, you know. And, and how many crew did you have on set? Uh, on, on set, I think we had about 25 people. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's amazing. I mean, just you know, for five minutes, it took eighteen of us plus a dog. <laughs> <laughs> the dog really liked the cold weather. I bet. Yeah. The... <laughs> <laughs> you can't explain to the dog that it's for art. You know. It's, yeah. <laughs> what? What are the? I don't know if we actually got any shots of it. I'm hoping that possibly our, our behind the scenes photographer got um, some shots. We refer to it as the Bertie Pie because we had this beautiful oval dog basket and Bertie was just underneath in it just his little nose poking out at one stage underneath <laughs> Craig lying on top of him to um to keep him warm and uh and, and was there a Bertie Pie Wrangler someone to take <laughs> <laughs> but I mean these jobs pop up don't they I'm, I'm like working on like another short and you're like oh I'll do this I had the same mindset the alpha image yeah this would be good because it's like one location and we'll probably, and you go through it like in five seconds in your head. Yeah, we'll need like seven people on set. And then when you really get down to it, that number starts becoming 27 people. And yeah, then we'll like, think, can we cut that back? And then you realize, no, none of those people can go. They're all very important doing it. I know, well, it's, it's, it, 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 because we were filming in the middle of a country park and so on at night, therefore we needed people to hold on to lamps to make sure that they yeah. were right and look after you know the lamps that we were using to light. The Craig um, he met over earlier was um, responsible for both Bertie when I wasn't man when he wasn't working with me and for doing catering as well. Um, but it's just you know it's it's runners, it's having people who can just say oh. We just, you know, this is the this is suddenly arisen. We need you need somebody there and then to actually just be able to go and do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, get something organised for you. Um, I just wanted to thank Matt Novak, who's just been pu uh, pushing the fact that the show on is is on as well. Thank you for tweeting that, Matt. Um, okay, so we you've done all your pre-production, you've done the filming. Um, as I say, you've done the you've done editing. You've got the composers. You've got, you've got your composer on board you've got um a soundtrack you've got it all together now you then went into how many festivals did you go into in fact uh we done great something like six or eight six to eight something like that something like yeah. i was looking on the website and i must ask you about the website as well yeah website that's important <laughs> um, Web design. The exciting stuff yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you how you say you actually went into six uh, yeah. festivals how many festivals did you actually approach how many did you submit to uh we must have a lot more than that there must be something like 50 we probably submitted to um the way we started was uh you know start with the big ones and then you that you're kind of not expecting to, and then go down to stuff that's more, especially for a genre film that's more um, aimed at the films that you've you've made. So um, there was Fright Fest, Sci-Fi Festival in Australia, these kind of things um, that are looking for something with the aesthetic and the themes that you're doing. Because a, a lot of you know film festivals are a curation experience, so it's not. Um, I speak to other filmmakers all the time and obviously there's people 
venting about not getting into x y and z but it is a curation experience so it should be a film running in a theme and like the people are programming it for a purpose because it slots into their certain program so um yeah we just uh we just submitted and then hope that we'd hear back from some and thankfully some really great festivals did get back in touch and we could go and see them a couple in london as well I, yeah, absolutely. Well, it was at Fright Fest that we met in the afternoon, yeah. and uh, I, 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 saw, I saw it. Do you, how much do you think, I have to say, it is the most professional looking website for a short film that I think I've ever seen? Because you've got an electronic <laughs> press kit, you have got um, behind the scenes making of featurette yeah. um, for a short film. I mean, the whole thing feels like a feature film. Yeah. Um, it doesn't feel like a short film at all. So, how did the website how did the website come about i i made the website i just started tinkering about and and made it so uh, it just took it just i just plugged little bits in i made it um before we even shot the film actually so you know even though there's hardly any people before a short film because you don't know who it what it is or what it's about or anything i felt it would be good I remember on an, another film I was on, people were like, oh, you should like do a blog and it's just for the crew so they can go, oh, that was a really funny moment, you know, during production or something like that. And I thought, yeah, I'll do it this time around. And then you've got that whole back catalogue of, of kind of like a film diary and you can go back and have a look um, years into the past. So, uh, yeah, I just set that up before we before we even started rolling. I think it was the first thing I did after I wrote the script because I'd written it and I kind of knew when I got it on to draft whatever number, I was like, I've got, I've just got to make this, this is, this is going to happen. So let's get the website up there and start um, doing everything. But on the other hand, it is also when you're approaching um, finances for like, say a feature film, you want to be, a, it's not, there's so many that it's just, Oh, get the film made and then it's job done. But you want to be able to show, no, we will, we'll make a whole package, you know, it's going to have everything done to a professional level. So um, something like the EPK, which, you know, I, I assume most consumers wouldn't really know, well, they might know what it is, but wouldn't care about so much, but it's just for, uh, for anyone who does and wants to find out more. And also, so you can say, look, you can trust us with your money. We will do this on a feature and you'll get at least the same, because we've done it on a short film. And, and just for those who don't know, EPK stands for Electronic Press Kit. Um, and then basically, it, it's, as I say, if you go to, if you um, Google the Alpha Invention, it's thealphainvention.com. Yeah. Um, you'll see all the EPK and, and, and all, all the stuff that you've put up there. There's a wealth of information. And you've got some great reviews up there as well i think from the telegraph as well as starburst uh yeah uh, we got the telegraph the guardian and starburst yeah magazine. and where do, and so where did these come from did this just come from the the screen the one of the festivals or no that that was from me after it was done uh i just got in contact with these people on twitter and i was just like you don't have to i'm an independent filmmaker i've just made a short film um i I think it's really good. I hope you do too. You can tell me what you honestly think. And if you do like it, um, can I just take what you've said and use it as a quote on the website, DVD, marketing materials, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, and then those critics did and they're the ones who liked it and, uh, and said yes. So um, I was very grateful to have their, their opinion because it, it does, after they're kind of, some of the first people to see it and obviously they you know that they're not going to um they're gonna be frank and say what they think and it is as as uh as self-assured as you can be which i think a director should be it is nice to kind of get that first feedback and even maybe some of the the constructive criticism they've had you kind of go right you know i'm not completely deluded now um I've made this and uh, it is something that I think it is. So we're near enough to what I think it is. And, and as you say, I think one of the interesting things about it as well, it's, it's a kind of a niche market, if you like, because there aren't that many short sci-fi films made. Yeah. 
and and also it kind of crosses genre as well because as I say, I saw it at Fright Fest, um, and just sitting there chilled, and I was uh, uh, kind of like, because when you're at Fright Fest, for those of you who don't know, basically you see a whole block for about an hour or so of short film after short film after short film. So I just I just remember sitting there and thinking, oh, love love the look of this of this string. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. and it, it's just got this wonderful, wonderful the, the way the way it builds so beautifully. Um, so you you got you built the website immediately after you filmed it. That sounds very very smart. Um, even before you had filmed it, and you just kind of kept it there and just told your mates about it. Yeah. Um, and so on. You got the festival and then it's obviously now available on iTunes and how did that come about? Uh, so once it was done I was putting it into festivals and I also sent it to uh, a company called Shorts International who are a short film distributor and they operate they have offices in London and LA I think and uh, I sent it to them um, on the same pretense like we we'd love to have your platform to get this available they have Unfortunately, they don't have TV distribution in England, but they do uh, in various other countries across Europe and also in in the States. So it's just about getting more people to be able to see it. And then they also have the VOD services of uh, iTunes and Amazon Instant. Um, and yeah, so I sent them a screener um, and they they liked it and said that they'd they'd be willing to get on board with it and help us get it seen. Right, it's interesting because I was at um, BAFTA uh, a couple of weeks ago um, yes. uh, for sh the short, short sighted, um, where uh, Chris Tidman. Chris Tidman. Yeah, Chris Tidman was there, and he was talking about the fact that actually the French are really fond of short films and Canal Plu. Um, <laughs> show an awful lot of they may show them at one o'clock in the morning um but an awful lot you know, they, there is there is there is something that the french do is watch short films on their tv and they're, they're very popular yeah um, yes. that's really great i think i do think it's um it's an underrated art form i mean everyone everyone complains that films are too long now and that you know it's like 90 minutes blah 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 it's like these are even short so you can get a little story and be done with it and the time it takes to you know, boil the kettle and have a cup of tea. So it's, they're seen a lot of the times and they are an entry point into the industry uh, and something that we, you know, use as say a showreel or a calling card um, because they are of a lower budget on in general than feature films. But I think they should be considered uh, an art form in their own right and just seen for what they are, which is... That, yeah, that, that is that is very interesting as well. Because again, one of the points that was being made um, uh, at, at the short sighted at BAFTA, it was absolutely fascinating day. Uh, and one of the speakers was making the point. I'm not sure if it was Chris or it was somebody else who was saying that basically American companies, and big big TV stations, are not looking for pilots so much because the pilots are actually quite expensive to produce yeah but actually a 15 20 minute short film is a proof of concept to yeah. get somebody's back you know for something you know for a, a big, bigger project possibly then an hour long pilot yeah and something like just as a way of showing not just you as a filmmaker but your story idea yeah um in, in, not necessarily in this case but you know the there is something there and therefore this might be a way of get gaining interest um yeah. that there's an awful lot you can do with short films um but as you say i mean one of the reasons i got interested in short films is because it's uh, it's short fiction as far as i'm concerned I, yes. i'm a huge lover of short stories and we and we respect them almost you know novellas and even shorter just anthologies of short fiction we kind of there's no they're not seen as a lesser class of literature you know mm -hmm. they're just seen as exactly what they are short fiction um and it, i think that's a great analogy and it's it's just short stories can be magnificent they can just be so compact and uh and just deliver well, it's interesting and i think you tend to find a lot of them are um 
uh, sorry, I'm just, I'm just pausing just slightly to invite one of the one of our viewers who said that he'd like to come on and meet you and ask you a question. That's Don Pettit. Let me just see if I can get Don on as well. Okay, so I've just posted an invitation to Don. He may be coming up, able to come on and join us. Um, was that they lend themselves to actually dark tales. Um, the short form itself lends itself to quite dark tales because you need to deliver something. It's actually very difficult to make somebody go and feel really satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> going, oh, that was lovely um, in the short form. Um, it's possible. I'm not saying it's impossible at all. You know, and, and I'm sure they're really good. At it, but most short stories that you, you see, they're either going to be rather whimsical, which don't really touch you emotionally, but actually to get something that touches you emotionally, and the short form really does um, uh, touch on that part. So it's it's out on Amazon. It's out on uh, so Amazon Instant. Did you say? Yes. Yeah. The 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 VOD service that Amazon run. Um, I think they keep changing their name. I think it's Amazon Instant currently. So. Uh, it's interesting. And the question that we're talking about this, and um, and I must just share with you um, uh, that uh, Lilith has just seen the fact that I'm wearing her T-shirt and is totally <laughs> delighted. Um, the, jo, another question from Joe, uh, whilst we're waiting for Don possibly joining us. The sci-fi genre is one of my favourites. Where do you see the future of sci-fi going as far as TV and cinema? So where do you see the future of sci-fi going? I, I don't know. I mean, there's, a, there's a, a science fiction film coming out in a month or so that might be quite big i think it's like a sequel or something <laughs> <laughs> if that's that quite one. successful that might uh kick off you know even more copycats um i do that's a different kind of sci-fi uh not one that um i'm not saying i i dislike it any less but i feel that's kind of fantasy sci-fi where it's like lord of the rings but Swords are being replaced with laser guns or lightsabers. It was referred to as space opera. When space it first opera came. is a good. It's yeah. space opera, and it is exactly what it is. It's yes. this huge, great, grand scale of of, yeah. of stuff and so. And then there's the science fiction that I think Alpha Invention is stuff like Blade Runner. Any of Philip K. Dick novels are uh, so any of the hundreds that have been adapted. What's interesting with Joe's question is that um, Man in the High Castle, a Philip K. Dick novel, has just been made into a series. I think it might it's be out in America now. Um, is it on Amazon or Netflix? I, I saw it on Amazon. Amazon, Amazon. Amazon, yeah. Yeah, it's on Amazon. Um, which is, you know, conceptual sci fi and the idea of uh, what if the Nazis and the Japanese won World War II? And so they both co own America, one on the East Coast, one on the West. Um, it, I think in terms of television, it'll be interesting to see how that picks up, whether what they call thinking man's science fiction, um, can, can kick off and, you know, uh, produce a, a, a glut of other ideas that, uh, producers will want to get made because it makes money. Um, I think what's really interesting in the theatrical world is you do get these great little films pop up. Um, Ex Machina came out earlier in the year and um, performed well. So you get these, um, these, the film industry doesn't like to um, go out on a limb too much. They like to see the success and then you'll get more and more of them. And the more we get of those kind of science fiction films where they're posing those philosophical questions, which I find really interesting, because I think in a roundabout way, they can say a lot about humanity in that way, you know, and, uh, and I suppose that's what it's all, what we're trying to do is you're expressing uh, what all of this is about, this weird thing that we're living. Um, and I think when we see more and more of those films coming out, we'll, if we go and support them, then we can, uh, we can expect to see more, but I don't know in terms of the long run about the future of science fiction. It would just be nice for more original ideas to keep coming up and be produced. No, but that's a, I suppose that is an interesting question. Do you regard yourself as a sci-fi filmmaker? Uh, not, not strictly. Uh, the next projects I'm working on aren't science fiction. 
but um it's certainly something i love i would i wouldn't ever do just science fiction uh but i'd like to dip my toe in that water and do it as well as i possibly can whilst i'm there okay that's fair enough that's right and i've just heard the word from don that don's not going to be able to join us um <laughs> because he's just started his shift at the blood in the snow film festival oh, which wow. is taking place in toronto um, oh, cool. this weekend i know chris alexander from um fangoria is going along this weekend as as well and it's blood in the snow sounds so much fun um <laughs> i'm probably at toronto at this time of the year there is an awful lot of snow um yeah it just yeah. <laughs> it bring, so bring your own blood okay. yeah no, absolutely um matt uh, novak did ask would there be any plan to adapt the alpha invention into a feature if a prop opportunity presented itself it's not something I've planned for. I, I made it, and it, one of the things that attracted me to it was, was it seemed so, it fit so well to the short form mm. storytelling mechanic. Um, I, I would rather be going on to other stuff uh, mm. in a feature. So it's just, it's not uh, about a direction or a career path, it's just what appears in your head. And it, for all the the years I've been working on this, it's never come into my head how it would work in a ninety to one hundred and twenty minute, you know, uh, form. There's a kind of seed about how you twist it. I think it would be a different kind of film based around the same concept. Yeah. Um, it would look a lot different. It would have, you know, there'd be various different characters that have changed and everything. Um, but. I'm hoping that uh, someone would, <laughs> would trust, if they like the Alpha Invention, they want to make a feature, they, they trust it enough that we could go, this is something completely different, but uh, just as good. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I, having seen this thing, I've, I've watched it about three, four times, and I, it, it is perfect in and of, of itself. It's not anything that immediately you think, oh, this is part of a much larger thing. Yeah. Um, it, it it really really works and if you haven't guys if you haven't had a chance to see it yet please i do urge you to go and do so um it's available on itunes in the uk in america it's available on amazon instant uh, as we've been plugging it's really really worth 15 minutes of your time um very much so okay so well, we're coming to the end of the show anyway um what are you working on now what else can we should we be looking for I'm doing, I'm working on another short, basically I'm working on a feature, getting the first feature off the ground, I'm writing that at the moment. Um, uh, something completely different, as I said, it's got more of a kind of western vibe, um, a modern day western I should say, not like cowboys, just the, the genre tropes and kind of bending them, as I hope we did with Alpha Invention, into something a bit new, so you take those right. things that people have seen and find familiar and you're kind of rotating the prism, so it so it shows a different something different that they haven't seen. Um, so that would be doing that. Uh, but I realise as a first time fil feature filmmaker, these things take quite a while to get off the ground. So I've got a, an idea for a short I'm going to do in the meantime, which science fiction does come in in a sense. It, it's it's a little bit twenty percent sci-fi. Yeah. Okay. That sounds very interesting. We just had a very quick last minute. Um, do you happen to know if um, the Alpha Invention is available on iTunes in Canada? Uh, I know it will be from the 4th of December. Uh, I don't believe it is until then. But right. you can go and check and see if it is. <laughs> if it is and by all means. Uh, <laughs> so the answer is, so this is from Steve Zarebski. Um, yeah. Steve, yeah, please go in and check. But definitely at the 4th of December, which is the end of the week, basically it's next yes friday yeah it's friday um next, next friday um so if it's not there on your um uh, your system the va a, a video on demand vod uh system on either amazon instance or itunes um then yeah look for it at the end of the week it certainly should be there um mark this has been fascinating this has been really really interesting i've really yeah. enjoyed this yeah really good. good really good we discussed everything <laughs> Except the poster behind you, but we covered that before the... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Malcolm McDowell looking over my shoulder. Malcolm McDowell and, you know, the ghost of Stanley Kubrick standing yeah. behind your shoulder. Um, 
Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, just to remind people that next week I'm going to be chattering with Graham Humphreys. Um, he's an artist uh, known for posters and so on. He's uh, met anybody in the UK who's interested in horror will recognize some of his images. Uh, and in some of those of you are fans of the show and Astron 6, the editor, and Lawrence Harvey, Astron 6, uh, the editor, um, the DVD cover that was sent, or the Blu-ray cover that was sent from me, that's a Graham Humphreys um, painting. And, and of course, Leviathan, uh, the Hellraiser documentary, um, Graham did all the artwork for that, as well as for Your So Cool Brewster, the Fright Night documentary that's going coming out uh, next year. So um, I shall be chatting with uh, Graham next week. And uh, in the meantime, I just want to say thank you very much indeed for joining us, Mark. Thank you for having me. It's really good fun. Good, good, good. All right. Well, I shall stop this broadcast and I will hopefully see some of you folks next week. Good night. <laughs>